9.30, we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. If you're watching out there, my name is Craig, the Natural Medic. Welcome to the Natural Medic Adventures podcast. Today, we're interviewing a special guest here, Dr. Natalie Bonthias from Survival Med. Hope I said your yes. name right. Okay. And she is here to talk to us today about wilderness medicine education and just in general backcountry best practices for being out there and enjoying the outdoors. I know I've got a deal here of your bio, but you want to just give us like a the elevator pitch of about yourself? Thank you for having okay. me on here. It's, it's great to do this. Thank you. So I, I am Natalie. I have a background in neuroscience and I've applied that towards my education in wilderness medicine. I got my medical degree from the University of Central Florida and then graduated and wanted to do something that combined all of my interests. So I have dove into neuroscience and how that applies to survival and the mind in certain extreme environments. And then also founding Survival Med. I wanted to educate people on these topics and make sure that there was a way for people to conveniently be able to get their courses on wilderness first aid and um, many other things so that they felt better prepared out there. Awesome. Going back to, I know how I got involved in the outdoors. As a child, did you like enjoy playing outside and going camping with your family? Oh, or? yeah, absolutely. My family has been outside for as long as I can remember. I have always loved that kind of stuff. My interest really took off when I graduated a little bit early from my undergrad. And so I went and lived in Austria for a little while. And so I was right at the foot of the Alps. And that really piqued my interest in the outdoors. I was able to do lots of extreme sports over there and mountain climbing, skiing, all that stuff. And so it was a really a great time and really solidified my interest in the outdoors and my desire to apply my medical degree towards that. Awesome. They do what the X games or something in Austria. <laughs> or is that right? I think, I, I think so. I didn't see it there, but <laughs> I do believe that. I know it, it's, it's kind of like the Olympics. It rotates. Yeah. So as far as Austria goes, as far as their their view of, I guess, backcountry or wilderness medicine, do they have different views than us, or do they do things a little differently? What, what was your experience? You know, I'm not totally sure. I was more just involved in all the recreational stuff over there. I wasn't. I hadn't started my medical degree yet. I didn't work oh, in gotcha. any kind of wilderness medicine capacity there, but that was where my okay. interest originally grew to be in that outdoor space and to do something unconventional with my life and to not follow the typical trend of what a doctor does working only in a hospital, but to apply it in a, a cooler context. And so that's then when I came back to the United States, I got involved in the Wilderness Medicine Society, met all kinds of other physicians that really dedicate their lives towards this field and fell in love with it. Awesome. Yeah. I'm the same way. Growing up here in East Texas, people think about Texas as being a desert and right. cowboys and cactus and stuff like that. But in the eastern part where I where I grew up, it's it's pine trees, it's lakes. And I was able to be involved with the Boy Scouts. Got my Eagle Scout, was in Explorers, and we got to do a lot of, you know, outdoor stuff like that. And of course the kids in my neighborhood, we had some woods behind them. They're not there now. They've been knocked down for houses right. in the neighborhood, but <laughs> But we played in the woods and we did all kinds of fun stuff. You Very know, cool. Played war and whatever and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. So my so one of my first you know experiences with it wasn't really I would say wilderness or backcountry med was just I have this I found this the other day you can see that oh yeah on the camera so a little spin wheel thing oh my gosh that I got in Boy Scout first aid training like way back in the day. Very cool. <laughs> Yeah. That's great that you still have yeah. it. Yeah. I, I just happened to find it. 
And uh, I was like, wow, that's going back to the day. Probably my next experience, I would say, with Wilderness Med was when I was working with Arkansas State Parks back in the early 2000s. We, I don't think it technically was a wilderness first responder course, but it was like a one week long kind of park oriented first responder type course. It wasn't really wilderness because most of the state parks are not <laughs> gigantic and like some of the national forests and national parks out west. Right. But, but that was really interesting. That really got my, my interest. And then when I, when I left the park world, I, I ended up going into EMS and right. one of the, one of the courses that I took, actually I took vacation to do this. I took wilderness uh, advanced life support oh, up in Durango very cool. back in 2016. And that was a week long intensive course. And that was, I was thinking, why did I take vacation to do this? Cause <laughs> it was pretty intense. I think that was wilderness medical society. I'm not sure of the exact of who did that. The, the, some guy out of Maine, the doctor that wrote the book actually was there to teach the course. And there was some other people from the local fire department and everything. We did a whole bunch of different scenarios. And that was what really solidified me having already been in the park outdoor world through scouts and through you know previous uh, career. Yeah. And then being an EMS, it's just like, wow. Right. Yeah. For a lot of people taking a, a wilderness medicine course, even at a young age or all the way up at an older age can really get them interested in not just the outdoors, but also medicine. I've heard a, a lot of people that take a class like that and then go on to become EMTs or paramedics. And that's where they right. originally fell in love with it. Absolutely. So you started the survival mid this, this year, yes. right? Yeah. It's, it's pretty new in the grand scheme of things. Okay. Yeah. I was working with the university of Utah to, to teach, their wilderness medicine courses and build up their specific program for a while over the summer. And then realize that there was this tremendous need for uh, wilderness first aid and wilderness first responder courses and many right. others too. So I branched off and started survival med and have been teaching it primarily online actually is where I've found that kind of niche because a lot of people, you sure. mentioned like you had to take an entire week off of vacation time and to go take that oh, course. Yeah. And there is a lot of value right. in the in-person stuff. And I, I think that when people are able to do it, that's great, but so many people can't do that. And it's there, they tend to be very expensive courses and people just don't want to take a whole week of vacation to go do that. And so I wanted right. to provide a much more convenient option for people. So I translated everything, put it online turn it into an entirely virtual course. It's totally self-paced. And so Survival Med now offers that Wilderness First Responder certification completely online. And then we also do first aid classes for a more basic approach to it for just gotcha. people that like hiking and want to know what to do if they get injured. Okay. Awesome. How did you, how did you come up with did, you just, did somebody like kind of spark that idea in your head to, to come up with this business or did you? Yeah, I think it was something that I had in the back of my head throughout medical school, just knowing that there was a need for it. But of course, I was really busy getting my degree at that point and couldn't commit to <laughs> starting a company. So sure. When I sure. graduated, though, I had many different conversations with people, both at the University of Utah and also just in the search and rescue industry and people that ran, you know, backcountry guide trips. And I realized that there was just this huge need for it. And I had all the skills to do it and to bring it, you know, into the virtual environment. And so it's gone really well. And I've been really happy with the number of people I've been able to reach in just the last four months or so, I think. It's been a pretty smooth ride, which has been pretty surprising given you expect a lot of bumps in yeah. the road when you're starting a new company, but it's been pretty great so far. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Let's see. I'm reading off my list of questions. 
tell me more about the living in the Alps. Yeah. I, I, in my mind, I think about, you know, you said you didn't really, didn't really, weren't, you weren't involved at that level with the wilderness or backcountry med at that time. But I think in my head that class, like 80s cartoon type of deal with the, the, the big dog with the little keg of whiskey. Oh, under yeah. Under his, running around to save people. Yeah. I would say I lived a very minimalist life during that time. And that's something that I'm very, still is in my blood is my, my biggest priorities were just getting out into the mountains and enjoying my time there, hiking, training for a marathon at the time, and just spending as much time as I could and living on very little. I had almost nothing when I was living over there. I could only take one bag as a carry on for the entire seven months that I was there. So it was a very surreal experience and definitely, I think it gave me an an approach to life that a lot of doctors don't have either in understanding that I, I do want to spend as much time doing that as I can. And that's what I'm really passionate about. And I want to help others be able to, to feel that level of happiness as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's that's why I started this podcast was to I've as I as I explained and as you explained you know, the kind of the same deal there we're wanting to get our expertise and our knowledge out there to people right. and help them enjoy because reflecting back it's almost the end of 2021 you know, reflecting back in the last two years 2021 20, 2020 it's been a mess yeah and everybody's life is turned upside down. And I think a lot of people are coming to the outdoors for solace or stress relief, whatever. And I, and I think that's a, it's a great opportunity to reach out those of us that have that knowledge and experience in different areas that regarding that. Yeah, absolutely. I think to, yeah, to impart our wisdom and our knowledge. Yeah. I think the same thing. Actually, the, um, Fox Network did a story on survival med a few months ago in Salt Lake City, and that was really their, you know, realization too was that during COVID, especially, a lot of people wanted to get outside because it was the only place they could go, and you know, lots of other things were closed at the time, but you can't really close the outdoors. Right? <laughs> you can close national parks and whatnot, but most spaces are still open during a pandemic like that. And it's one of the few places that people felt safe going. And so you had a huge uptick in the number of people that were doing those activities and not all of them were very well-trained. People didn't really, you know, have the knowledge necessary to be able to go and do some of those things. So that was another motivation in starting survival med was just that recognition or recognizing the need for it. And that this is something that's, continuing to grow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. The, I've seen several news reports. There's record numbers of people coming out and, and recreating in national parks, national forests, state parks, et cetera, throughout not only the United States, but throughout the world. And I think, like you said, a lot of people, they want to get out there, but they don't really know the first place. Yeah. <laughs> To start, like they don't know what they're in for, so to yeah. speak. And that, and having, in my opinion, I'm a park person, and also coming from the EMS perspective, we going back to the history of EMS. EMS was designed in the '60s. It was thought up as accident prevention. We can, we have all these people foolishly hurting themselves at home. And wouldn't it be great if we had some medically trained people that could, you know, provide basic care at that point, they didn't have the paramedic end of it things. And so that, that whole aspect of it has really, has really changed a whole lot of delivery of medicine. To the general populace. And of course, being here in East Texas, I haven't, I worked on the 911 service 
here in the East Texas area for, gosh, let's see, about five years, mostly as a medic. And we don't have a whole lot of remote places, but we have had to to respond to some environmental emergencies and things like that, such as, I mean, it, it's Texas, just like Florida. It gets super hot in the summertime. Right. Upper 90s and sometimes in the hundreds, depending on what part of the state you're in. Yeah. We had some people, probably the closest thing I'd say to backcountry medicine that we did one time, we had a guy that was, they were lost down this, we're right close to Louisiana. So a lot of our little rivers and streams, they call them bayous. So one of our little side bayous right on the county line, there was a, there were some people that were down there frog hunting, supposedly. And we had to do a search and rescue deal with them. And so we had a lot of, we had the sheriff's office involved. We had game wardens. We had our uh, flight service and all that kind of thing. And so I was just thinking, wow, this is crazy here in in this little East Texas. Yeah. Yeah. It happens in places you wouldn't expect. You don't have to be very far from civilization or a town to, to find yourself in a situation that you're totally unprepared for. So. Exactly. That's the reason I wanted to have you you on today to get people aware of you know what's available out there for more. Now I would say probably at the the wilderness first aid, probably a lot of people out there have had CPR first aid training, but they're not in that mindset of what happens when I'm out there. I'm ten miles on a trail, and there's no there's no jeep roads. There's no access to me. What happens if I fall off this cliff and break my leg? What happens if I, what happens if I get a, this gigantic blister on my foot? What happens if I get bit by a snake? Right. You know? Yeah. And one thing that I teach in my courses is you don't need a life-threatening injury when you're in the wilderness context in order for something to quickly become life-threatening. A sprained ankle when you're in broad daylight at noon on a popular trail, that's not too big of a deal. You're going to have people there to help you. You're going to have plenty of time to figure out what to do, plenty of resources, but a sprained ankle when you're alone eight miles from the trailhead and it's almost dusk, that's a big problem. And so I think that it's important to not underestimate things. And partly with my background in neuroscience, I've been able to to blend together psychology with wilderness medicine and understanding why people make certain decisions, and what leads them down a certain path. And one thing that I consistently see is that people underestimate the probability of something bad happening just because it's uncomfortable to think about those things. And so we just avoid thinking and talking about it ahead of time. And we tend to believe that we're going to be lucky and that we're going to be the only ones who don't ever have something like that happen. So that's just a really common mental error that people make. And then something small can go wrong and it can just become a much bigger problem as, as time goes on. If you don't have the right training or the right resources. And so these are all things that I teach about in my courses and I try to make people prepared for a variety of situations, just knowing a few things about a lot. And I think that can go a long way for people. Absolutely. Absolutely. An ounce of knowledge can make a big difference and, and, and grow into a, like a a little seed becomes a big tree. Once you plant that in somebody's uh, mind through, through training or education or what have you. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and that's a great thing. Did you have a, a mentor or somebody that kind of helped you branch yourself into this, into survival med, into your company? Yeah, absolutely. Did you have somebody kind of influence you? Yeah, okay. I, um, there is another doctor, Dr. Inga Bretson. He works at the University of Utah and he directs their wilderness medicine program. And he's okay. who originally brought me in to help him build that earlier this year. And then just in talking to him, 
he was originally the one who pointed out this need for the specific courses that I now teach through survival med. And he was the one who introduced me originally to this idea that typical park rangers and ski patrollers and search and rescue members, a lot of them are either volunteers or they're paid very right. modestly for what they do. And a lot of them don't have an extra thousand dollars laying around to go take a wilderness first responder course. And yeah. yet there's hundreds of thousands of people in the U.S. that need to take this every year. And both for their jobs and for just the knowledge that comes with it and feeling more prepared to help treat people out there. And so he pushed me in this direction. He's like, you have all the knowledge and resources to go do this. You're technology savvy because <laughs> you're younger and uh, you can handle yeah, teaching this yeah. in a virtual environment. And so I took that and sure. ran with it. And that's where survival that actually started was with that. And yeah, I think it's awesome to have a mentor like that. And I think anyone in, in this space, whether it's in wilderness guiding or medicine or the overlap of those two, you need to have people that are ahead of you and can show you the ropes originally. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I've listened to some of his podcasts that he's put out on the University of Utah Wilderness Med page. That's yeah. Yeah, that's some really good stuff yeah. that's out there. And any anybody watching or listening out there, uh, definitely look that up. That's University of Utah Wilderness Medicine. Is there a name for the podcast? Um, I sure. think it's Advanced Wilderness Life Support. And okay. I think it's on yeah. Google Podcasts, um, Spotify. Yeah, so it's out there. That's definitely some, some more in-depth stuff we're not going to get into today, of course. But uh, definitely, if you're listening or watching and you're interested in that subject, that's something I would definitely check out. I've listened to several of the podcasts. Well, the good thing about podcasts, too, is since they're audio only, because we're doing a video one, but the audio version of it, you can put it on while you're driving around. You can, right. you can while you're cleaning house or while you're doing something else, you can always throw that on and listen to it while you're running or whatever. That's the great thing about podcasts. That's why I started this too, because of the the portable nature of the medium. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. let's see. There's a lot of books out there that that deal with wilderness medicine or backcountry medicine or survival austere type. Is there a particular book that you would recommend to the audience? regarding one or more of those. Yeah, subjects. that's a good question. Recently, I did an interview with Kevin Grange. He's a paramedic in Yosemite, and he's written okay. a few books now about his experiences working in wilderness medicine and as a paramedic in those austere places. And it's, some of those stories are really funny that he writes about just kind of people sometimes lose their sense of common sense when they're in the outdoors. And so just some of the questions that he's gotten as a paramedic working in Yosemite at that, reading about that in, in his most recent book, I believe it's called Wild Rescues. That was really funny. Okay. And also the stories he tells, they're not all funny. Some are really serious. And <laughs> I think it, that balance sure. of it was just made for a really good read. So anyone interested in this topic, I think would love that book. And then also I read Lawrence Gonzalez's Deep Survival recently. I think it okay. hits on a lot of the, the topics that I've researched and been very interested in that kind of combine neuroscience with survival and how some people are able to make it and for some reason, other people are not in those same situations. And so they, he just recounts these stories of people who've experienced life-threatening events. And he explains how the mind processes these strong emotions and instinct, instincts. And then he kind of develops this model for how people think and how the world works in that way. And how you're 
constantly adjusting to your environment, even when you're not in an extreme survival situation, even more on a day-to-day basis, how it applies to our decision-making. So I think that was also a really fascinating read. Awesome. I haven't read it yet, but I saw the movie Into the Wild. Oh, yeah. <laughs> which is about the the young guy. I can't recall his name right this moment, but he goes out into the wilderness of Alaska yeah. and and pretty much tries to survive. He's he's trying to change his life and get out away from everything in the world and yeah. goes out and lives in the middle of the Alaskan wilderness and ends up ends up perishing out there. Spoiler alert. <laughs> But the book I know is really good. Yeah. Right? What I've heard, I haven't, read, I haven't read the book yet. It's on, I have it in my bookshelf. I just haven't got to it yet. Yeah, that's actually one. And I, the same I've been wanting. Yeah, and the movie is really good. I think uh, I think it was Emil Hirsch. I think is the plays the the kid or the guy, and uh, does an excellent job of portraying that. Like when he's getting toward the end, which is kind of like. That whole, like you were talking about, the whole, the whole mental game that you're playing with yourself. Yeah. When you realize you're in over your head, it's yeah. Wow. A lot of what what I've studied between when it comes to survival psychology is uh, it's not so much that it takes a certain type of special person to survive. I think that that was popularized by the media early on that. There's this kind of like survivor <laughs> gene that you can have, or this, sure. some people are just mentally stronger. And actually, what I think the reality is, is that it's just that people die unnecessarily sometimes because they're not able to think clearly. And it's not so much that the others were stronger or better; it's that the um, people who did perish may have made just mental errors due to just being completely overwhelmed. And so it's not so much that it's not a difference of strength or anything like that. It's just what we've seen is that people can quickly become not themselves when they're in that context. And when you're sitting around in a safe, normal environment, talking about theoretically what you would do, that's very different than when you're facing all those hormones, all the adrenaline, all the intensity and the terror of the real situation. And so a lot of people are not able to think as clearly as they would in other situations. And that's what leads them to make very silly mistakes often is what leads people to actually die in those environments. So that's where even taking a basic survival class or a basic wilderness medicine class can actually do a lot for people because what we see is that the less you're having to think (laughs) in those situations, the less you're having to uh, really think through what to do and to figure stuff out on your own, the more likely you are to survive because your thinking is just not going to be very clear. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And like you said, it's, it's all well and good to sit around and talk. If I was in this situation, I would do this yeah. or I would do that. But you really need to have an understanding of the possible situations. It doesn't mean they're, they're going to happen to you, but you need to be prepared for them just in case. Yeah. And one of the things, of course, in working in EMS, I've been a paramedic for going on eight years now. And I've I worked in the 911 system here. I worked in the 911 system in two places in Louisiana. And also I've, I've taught a little bit kind of part-time at community college. I was the skills guy for the uh, EMS program, working with EMT students and paramedic students. And, and to see the change is going to this by the student route here to see the change in those brand new wet behind the ears. EMTs, they have absolutely no clue what they're getting into. Right at the EMT level, because, you know, you have to be an EMT first and then you, you know, progress onto paramedic if you so choose to go to the dark side. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot to it and a lot goes into it. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. 
Yeah. I think it's the, it's the same thing with, with wilderness medicine. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the wilderness first aid class is kind of more designed for the, for the lay person. Yeah. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Right now I actually offer three primary classes through survival med. One is basic wilderness okay. survival and, that just runs you through a lot of the scenarios like we've talked about just so that you know a little bit about a lot and so that the most common stuff that you'll encounter in the outdoors you have at least the first few steps down about what you should do right. and that's totally self-paced it's pre-recorded and so people can just do that on their own time the next one is wilderness first aid and that has a lot of overlap with the survival class in terms of the scenarios and everything that sure. I teach with that. But it also has a little bit more of the hands-on, like how do you make a splint? How do you tie a tourniquet and stop bleeding? How do you improvise a neck brace? So that, and that's taught over Zoom, actually. I've taught a few in December here, and I'll be teaching three more in January. So you can just sign up for cool. that. and. It's about two and a half hours on Zoom, and you can come to whichever night is most convenient. And so that really works for people. I think they really like having the option to choose what night they want to come and to do it from their own living room. And if they can't come to a live session, they can just watch the recording and still get the certification. And then Wilderness First Responder is many steps beyond that Wilderness First <laughs> Aid where Sure. It's a longer course. Uh, it is all self-paced, though, and completely online. Right. And we still actually do test the practical skills. You actually have to submit videos and photos of doing it. And that one is more for people, if they just want the medical knowledge, then they're welcome to take that. I sure. think it's valuable for anyone, but specifically for people who work in the outdoor industry. They frequently need right. this certification. And so like park rangers, ski patrollers, search and rescue members, that's who we've largely been working with is the search and rescue industry and camp counselors, backcountry guides, anyone who works in the outdoors and is routinely sure. in situations where they're having to help someone out. That's what the, the, Wilderness First Responder or Woofer class for short is geared towards. Awesome. Yeah, and I've got that sign. I've got that on my list to take. I've got it. I'm going to try to hit that after the first of the yeah. year. I'm kind of but, but pretty solid until then. But, yeah, the course that I took is the, the next step up above that, which is the Wilderness Advanced Life Support. Yeah. And if you're listening out there, unless you're – you know, already an advanced provider, which is pretty much paramedic up all the way to doc. That's what that course is designed for. And it's a week long, intense course where you're doing practicals every day and you're doing lots of classroom knowledge and great course. But again, as you said, it's expensive. I happen to have the funds available at the time and I happen to have the time because when you work in EMS, <laughs> You tend to put in a lot of hours. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't unusual to do seventy two to one hundred twenty hours, you know, a week. Wow! Because we were doing twenty four hour or forty eight hour shifts, yeah. and that's. And then you know, sometimes you want to break, so I, I would, a would better break than to go to Durango, Colorado, and take your vacation and take a course. Yeah. That's just how much. Yeah. Of, that's just how much of a nerd I am. <laughs> and I ran out of water, so I'm going to Dr. Pepper. <laughs> There we go. Let's see. What else do we have on the list here? So out of all the people that you've interacted with from all the way at the top, MDs, EMS providers, park people, backcountry guides and ski patrol and whatever, what, has there been a favorite group oh, gosh. <laughs> that you have interacted with? That's I know it's kind yeah, of hard. Yeah, that's to, a tough question. I think... I don't know. I've had such great experiences at all levels. I think it is really neat to interact with other doctors and other physicians who specialize in this and are leading the charge in terms of 
doing research and and the nitty gritty medical side of it, that's always really interesting. And quite often they're very like quirky people too. They have a lot of really unique interests. And so that's, that's always fun. And that's, for that's sure. definitely something I've grown to love through the Wilderness Medicine Society and through different research projects that I was involved in throughout medical school. But then at every level, I think you have such neat like interactions and I love working paramedics and EMTs. I think they're really laid back and a fun group and they love learning about wilderness medicine. And so it's always fun teaching classes to them because they're a little bit more fresh eyed. If I would, if that makes sense, like they, they can be. And I think that is always fun. I really do love working with people, just lay people who don't have much of a medical background. I think yeah. In terms of the classes so far, like it's really rewarding to see people absorb so much information so quickly. And just, you can tell that it makes a huge difference in their confidence level going in the outdoors. And you go from not even knowing how to stop bleeding to knowing how to like improvise a neck brace if someone has a spinal injury and so it's really rewarding to work with people who don't have a medical background and uh, to teach them all the cool things. So I think I, it's hard to pick a favorite. Actually, the majority, just in terms of sheer volume, what I found is the majority of people so far who have taken survival med classes don't have a medical background just because the convenience of that online wilderness first aid certification over Zoom Oh, appeals to yeah. so many people and you're able to advertise it to hiking groups and just people who uh, just do this for fun. And so that's just sheer volume wise where I've seen the most interest, but then also like with the wilderness first responders being search and rescue uh, personnel and working with all of those squadrons it's been great at all levels awesome yeah I, I, i'm not trying to put you on the spot <laughs> oh yeah no <laughs> you you ask good questions um, <laughs> thank you thank you there's all kinds of perspectives and uh, backgrounds that people bring to this this type of training and i think it's great I I've always felt like I've been my mom's a retired teacher. My dad was in banking, but he was an educator in the banking area of this area of the state. And so I kind of through I don't know, genetics or whatever. <laughs> I've groomed myself into an educator, whether, yeah. I, whether I wanted to or not. And I'm glad that I'm glad that you're here today to, to tell us some more about this stuff because it, it's been really good. Are we, are we good on time? So yeah. Far? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me look. I know we're getting close to the time where we're going to do questions and answers. I don't know if anybody has chimed in. So give me one second here. Yeah. I don't see anybody so far, but we'll keep going. Perfect with some stuff here. But I know this is, uh, in, in, in my mind, you can kind of tweak it to your own likes, but as far as a backcountry first aid kit, like for your typical group size, I would say typical group size for most people is going to be like either one person. That's what I'm, I'm a, I'm pretty much a solo guy these days. A lot of people are going to travel with a partner or a friend or whatever, one or two people, what would you want to incorporate into your backcountry first aid kit? Yeah, I think one of the most important points I can make on that is a lot of people tend to buy pre-made first aid kits from Walmart or Amazon or whatnot. And I think that's definitely better than having nothing. It's 
sure. definitely better than being completely unprepared with nothing, nothing in your pack in terms of that stuff. But it's actually much right. better to create your own medical kit if you have any kind of knowledge or input on how to do that, just based on the situation that you're going to be in. A lot of those mm -hmm. pre-made kits are not tailored to your environment and they're not specific to the activities you are going to be doing. So exactly. if you're just out on a day hike, I think the most important stuff would be just like wound control. So like ACE bandages and uh, stuff for preventing infection. And so I, you can keep it very basic if you're doing very basic activities in general. And especially if you're close to close to rescue, if you would need it. And right. if you're going to be within cell phone range, likely, then that's a much different scenario than if you're going out on a week long backpacking trip on the sure. PCT or <laughs> somewhere where you may be without cell phone service for long stretches of time, you could be completely by right. yourself. And so then I would definitely make it a more extensive kit. I would throw in a flexible splint if you have one or pain control too. Even very simple stuff can go a long way if you do twist an ankle or get yourself injured. And again, ACE bandages are awesome. They're very flexible and adaptable and scissors and knives, knowing how to use a knife properly is a really important skill and can be applied in a lot of different scenarios. Water purification is huge too. It's really a bad idea to rely on only one method working for you the entire time, especially if you're going to be, again, pretty far out there without possible rescue if you need it. I would bring at least two different forms of water purification in case one isn't working for you. And Definitely yeah. know how to do that before you're going out there and trying to do it for the first time on the trail. That's usually not a good situation for people. Other than that, it is difficult to universally give recommendations oh, right. on survival equipment or anything. But one thing I teach about in my course that's really useful is the space blanket is actually a really useful device for people. and. Usually it's eight to ten dollars. It's this aluminum foil looking blanket and right. it has so many different uses in the wilderness context. You can use it as a blanket to prevent hypothermia, you can use it to create shelter, collect water. It's really reflective of the sun, so you can use it to signal for rescue if you need it, and so that's one of the one of the few things that I can universally say is useful to carry with you. Absolutely. I'm digging out one out of my bag here. Oh, great. I'm actually going tomorrow morning. I'm actually leaving on a three day backpacking trip. I'm actually going up to Arkansas to Eagle Rock loop, which is the longest loop trail in Arkansas, 27 miles. And it's, really an odd time for the weather because it's been the same deal as up here. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Well, there you go. This is the uh, SOL version emergency blanket. It's a little bit different than the plain Mylar because it has a tarp material yeah. on the outside, and then it has the reflective kind of Mylar stuff on the inside. But, yeah, it's going to be strange weather because it's going to be – here locally in, in my town, it's going to be uh, 70 degrees tomorrow for the high. And uh, it's going to be, it's up in the, the mountains. It's not the Rockies or anything. It's the Washita Mountains, which are right here at elevation. We're between 250, 300 feet down here in the flat piney woods of East Texas. But up, up there in the Washita, it gets up 2,000 or more feet. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit different. Yeah, <laughs> but but luckily it's not going to be too cold. But I always take a little bag, whether I'm day day hiking or in this case backpacking. I have this little bag, and I have the ten essential stuff in there, repair stuff. It's just some zip ties and some 
duct tape. We've got some fire starting stuff in here, medical. And it's funny that you were talking about the Walmart medical kit because I, I have Oh, one. well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it can be really useful. And again, I think it's better than not having anything. And in yeah. certain contexts, I think it would have everything that you do need. And I added some stuff to yeah. it. I had some leftover. This stuff is good for like ant bites. It's like some lidocaine oh, jelly yeah. that I had for leftover from the ambulance. It was expired on the ambulance. Yeah. So I took it. When I was working on the ambulance and, and they let me take it home with me, I put it in my little personal first aid kit. I've got some pain meds and some Benadryl yeah. that I added some, unfortunately, some, some Tom backpacking food. But this kit is actually pretty, pretty decent. I think it's called, it's a funny name. It's called the, the happy hiker kit <laughs> and it's available at Walmart. It's seven bucks. But it has, just a, as a basic kit, it has like sunscreen, it's got antibiotic ointment, band-aids, moleskin. I also, also added a a safety pin right there, oh, yeah. just in case. Let's see what else does it have. Insect protection cream. So it covers a full gambit of things for, and it's good for one person, I think. Yeah. But I did, like I said, I did make some additions to it. And. Uh, so that's all good. But I also have, like, I've, I like these kits from Adventure Medical. They're pretty good as far as having a balance of stuff. But like you said, it is difficult to have a kind of one size fits all kit. Yeah. But again, you know, as, as you said, it's better than, it's better than nothing if you are just getting started. In the uh, outdoor yeah, acti activities, what it, whatever you have available. I love REI. I've been a member of REI for, this was 1990, I think, Yeah. when I was in the Scouts. Uh, but it's three hours for me to go to REI and get some of their more high-end stuff. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think people get intimidated by thinking they need top-quality gear and they need all this extensive knowledge on the difference between these things. And to me, that oh, tends yeah. to keep people out of the outdoors. And it's unfortunate because in a lot of cases, just carrying a few really simple things is all you need. And so that's, you know, something that I, I want to teach more about in my classes. And so I think it's like you said, yeah, that, that kit, even just a really simple one from Walmart is uh, better than nothing. And Certainly, if you're not going out oh, yeah. on some really extensive backcountry trip, I think that it can go along. Yeah, that's that was just one I picked up because I wanted to. I think I've done a first aid video on this channel. Let's see when I do that. I think back in September, I believe, and I, I took your approach as to it's better than nothing to have some kind of a kit that provides the essentials and then tweak it to your own liking. Or if you're a little more bold, once you have some knowledge, you can come up with your yeah. own kit to tailor it to your, your specific situation because backpacking down here in East Texas and Arkansas and these areas is going to be different than going in, you know, Colorado or, or even in, down there where you are in Florida. Yeah. It's, the environment is different. Yeah. And if you're and if you're in up in the northeast and if you're in Maine and you're at the end at the tail end of the Appalachian Trail this time of year. Yeah. No. The situation is completely different. Yeah. What do you think is the most common backcountry injury? Um that that is out there. I know that's yeah. one of those hard to nail down exactly. But, I'm sure I could I'm sure I could find real data on that. I think just in terms of my own personal experience, yeah. I, we tend to, in our course, to be prepared for the worst. Like we talk about all these high intensity, really bad scenarios. And it's important to know what's true because yeah. well, those are truly life or death. But for the most part, just scrapes and cuts are, 
what most people will experience in the outdoors and twisted angles occasionally and having to decide is it broken or is it sprained and is it okay to keep hiking and so i think that and also just you know preventing infection of wounds that you do get is really important out in utah i actually live in salt lake city i'm just vacationing in florida right now but i uh, i think we actually do see a lot of mountain sickness in utah and so people will fly in and they'll come from a much sure. lower elevation and then then they get sick and so we see a lot of that actually and that affects a lot of people i think about i think like half about 50 percent of the population of the world is prone to mountain sickness knowing what to do in those scenarios is really important and i think if you spend enough time in the outdoors and you hike regularly and you do those types of activities i think you can expect to get lost at least a few times in your life and for most people hopefully Absolutely. that's not it's not a, too big of a deal in terms of they're not too far from civilization they're not too far from people that can help but i think that if you do it enough and if you're out there doing this type of stuff enough then then it's important to know what to do if you are lost and it's what i was what I was getting back to originally was very minor problems can become very life threatening pretty quickly in the outdoors. And it doesn't take a whole lot to go wrong in order for someone to be in a really serious situation. And so I think knowing what to do, even as like early on in the process as possible is important. Absolutely. Okay. Controversial question. If you have a blister, do you pop it or do you not pop it? <laughs> a good question. What I have always taught is if it's bigger than two centimeters and if it's causing you a lot of pain and really affecting right. your trip, then I would pop it, especially if you do have a sterile needle or something you can safely do that with. If it's smaller than about two centimeters, then generally we don't advise doing that. There is a you know risk of infection when you pop it. And so if it's smaller than that, then you probably just want to wrap it and try to reduce the friction over that area and okay. see if that helps. Mole skin is really useful for that. But yeah, it comes down to the individual person and what they're comfortable with and Sure, sure. But yeah, Absolutely. blisters blisters are super common. And you asked about the most common stuff. Blisters is <laughs> really, yeah, one of the more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you're going to pop it, audience, if you're listening out there <laughs> or watching, definitely use something that's sterilized. The safety pin is fine, but as long as it's sterilized alcohol or get the old lighter yeah. and hit it up so it's nice and clean. You don't want to be sticking just some dirty piece of metal into your foot. Yeah. If you decide to pop it, that's, we're not really going to, I think we're not really going to, we're not really going to say pop it or don't pop it. I think it's kind of an individual basis. Depending, and depending on, of course, where it's located on your foot. Yeah. If it's a striking surface of your foot, the bottom of your foot, the heel, and it's ginormous and it's going to rupture anyway, you might want to let it free, so to speak, yeah. that, and cover it up that way. It doesn't just do it on its own. So regarding lost behavior, I'm going to check for questions again in just a second. I didn't see any earlier, but we'll check a second. I picked up this for myself. Oh, yeah. For yeah. For uh, kind of a Christmas present to myself. But I'm, a, I'm an only kid, and my mom and I are very close, and my dad passed away about four years ago. Oh, yeah. That's okay. Thank you. I'm all she has and she's all I got. And what do you think about these type of devices? As far as communication and, you yeah. know, 
I think they're the awesome. Kind of I think I and yeah, definitely something I highlight in both both the first aid and the survival classes. Carrying a GPS device like that has saved a lot of lives. And especially if you're regularly in areas that don't have cell service, it's I think it's worth the investment. Of course, it's an individual opinion, but I think it's a really powerful thing to carry. And they have an SOS feature usually where you can mm-hmm. press it, it activates EMS, search and rescue, all the rescue teams in the area will be alerted and that has saved a lot of lives. I think the pitfalls of it are that you need to connect to all three satellites in space in order to have GPS tracking and in order for sure. your cries for help to go through essentially. And so people, uh, I've heard reports, at least in Utah, people being not too far from you know, downtown Salt Lake and just at the foothills <laughs> of the Wasatch Mountains. And for some reason, sure. not having GPS service on their Garmin or whatever GPS device they have. Hmm. So I don't think you can rely on it completely. And I think also when it comes to making decisions about what you're going to do in the backcountry, I think that sometimes it can give people a false sense of security, knowing that they can press that button and have people come rescue them. And unfortunately, what we see is sometimes people really push the boundaries in terms of where they're going and what weather they're going out in, just because they think that help is just a button away. And under normal circumstances, that might be true. They may be in a, a place that normally they would easily be able to be rescued. But when you're talking about really bad weather, bad environmental conditions. Search and rescue teams can't put their own members' lives at stake in order to come get you. And so if it's a really bad situation, you can't necessarily guarantee that people are going to be able to come and help you out. But overall, I'd say definitely something to invest in. And it's definitely worth carrying if you can. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm going to be reviewing this later on in the channel so people will know why I picked this one because there are a whole bunch of different ones out there. Back back when my dad was still with us, I had planned on doing a lot of backpacking because, like I said, EMS is <laughs> it's pretty pretty demanding on yeah. you. Know, I was planning on doing some backpacking trips, and I had, one of the, I had a spot device, which was just a little square thing with no screen. I think it's like the spot three or something like that. And I just upgraded to this Garmin because I, I liked it because it, it has a little screen on there and it has a little more features than the other one. So that's why I got that one. Yeah. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of good ones out there, but yeah, like you say, they do have the SOS feature on there, but you really should only push that if you're in, you know, dire need, Yeah. like absolute emergency. I I heard about a case recently from, a search and rescue leader down in Arizona. And he said that a family deployed that SOS button three times in one hike in the Grand Canyon. And all oh, wow. three times they declined rescue. They declined help. Turned out they were really just thirsty and wanted water and they didn't bring enough with them. And oh, so wow. you definitely hear stories like, really bad stories about people abusing it but i think for the most part i think that hasn't been a trend and that most people use it appropriately and really only when they do seriously need help sure that's just something to keep in mind i can talk to you all day about ems calls where we've gone to people's houses yeah (laughs) Even here in my own community, and like I, we went to one time, we went to a lady's house to adjust her, her medical bed. She thought we were the appropriate people to call. Oh, wow. So she, so she dialed 911 for us to come out there and adjust the settings on her medical bed, which it's fine. We're more than happy to be out there and help. The EMS has a bunch of roles in the community, and no big deal. Yeah. Some of the things people call an emergency 
I'm not going to say that they're ridiculous, but I would say they're uh, interesting. Right. Let's put it that way. We'll err on the side of of being nice here. Let's see. Got a few more questions. Let me look again to see if there's any questions from the audience. I don't see anybody asking anything right now. So now one thing I always try to go over, I want to go over this just real quick and go through it for the audience and just as a refresher in, in my mind, of course, is the 10 essentials. I'm sure you're familiar with those. Yeah. And so what we were saying, anytime you go out, if you're listening or watching out there, you need to make sure you have satisfied the 10 essentials. And you can, if you just go into Google and type in 10 essentials, I'm looking on REI's version right now. I have it bookmarked on my computer. The first one is navigation, which is talking about uh, a map and a compass, a GPS device or personal locator beacon, satellite messenger. And of course, all of these things, it's not good just to have them. We, you know, you want to be, you want to be, you know, have some knowledge of how to use them. A headlamp, because you never know when you're going to be coming back late on that trail or you get delayed for some reason and it gets dark, especially this time of year when the daylight hours are shorter and you anticipate a four hour trip on your hike and you end up taking eight hours. Sun protection, even in the months like this, sun protection is always good. Protect yourself from the sun, either with clothing or sunscreen, sunglasses, hats. We already talked about first aid. First aid is definitely something good to have. A knife or repair kit of some sort. Ability to start a fire. Fire is good for a lot of different purposes. Warming yourself, drying out clothes, purifying water, cooking food, and so forth. A shelter. We talked about a shelter a little bit uh, earlier with the uh, the space blanket that can be used as a shelter and a lot of other things. I always, obviously I didn't get to be this six foot two and 220 pounds by skipping on meals. So uh, I always bring extra food because I get hungry. And the body requires, I think people that are, that are unaware of their abilities or their understanding of, you know, how their body's going to behave on a, on a trail. They have never, they maybe they've never hiked a trail before. They might not bring enough food. So I think it's good to bring an extra Snickers bar or granola bar or something, or maybe a couple of extra ones, depending on your group size. Yeah. And then we talked about water a little bit. There's a whole lot of different ways to uh, purify water out there. I always carry a primary device myself. It depends on what I'm going to do. When I went to Arkansas before, back in October, I used the Catadyne Hiker Pro. But it's a little bulky and heavy, even and you have to and you have to pump it. Yeah. So it's labor intensive. So this time I'm going to since the weather's going to be cooperating and it's not going to be below freezing, I'm going to take the Sawyer Mini. Oh, okay. That's my plan. And I have some water purification tablets. I think they just expired like last month, but we're we're going to say they're good. I have those as a backup for my water. And then I think always take some extra clothes. You want to anticipate it being a little bit warmer or a little bit colder than whatever you imagine. Because like I said, here at in East Texas, in my town, we are pretty low down a couple hundred feet above the above sea level and then going up to the I'm not going to the Rockies or anything but going up into the Washita's it's going to be could be up to 2,000 feet taller than what I'm at now so I'm anticipating having some colder conditions excuse me so that kind of covers the 10 essentials there so definitely Take a look at those if you're listening or watching before you go out on your next adventure. And we've been on here for a little over an hour now, so I guess we'll wrap it up. You got anything else you want to add before we? I think this has been great. It's Yeah, it's been great to, to talk about this and definitely made me yeah. think about a few things that I haven't ever actually answered before in an interview. So it's always interesting to get on and do these. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah. I just, I, if anyone is interested in, in the survival med classes, 
I think, I, were you going to link the the course? Yeah, I'll put the a link in the wherever wherever this is posted yeah. to either on either on Buzzsprout or YouTube or yeah. Facebook. I'll put a link to uh, awesome. to your courses so people can get on there. Yeah, so definitely check that out. And I think too, if I'm always open to new courses and new collaborations. So if anyone is listening sure. that has a group that they work with or works in the outdoor industry in any way and wants to host any kind of class then definitely reach out to me. And I think that I'm open to many different things and I've done many different classes for different to tailor to different groups. So I'm always happy to do that. And yeah, it's exciting stuff. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here. Absolutely. And really had a good time talking to you today. Yeah. So anyway, I hope everybody's having a uh, happy holidays and uh, enjoying these last uh, few, I guess we've got about, what, two, two, a little over two weeks or so, maybe. Not quite that long. What is it? Oh, we have about a week and a half. Sorry. After I look at the calendar left in 2021. So I'm hoping that uh, 2022 will be better for most of us. All of us. I hope if you're thinking about getting out there and enjoying the outdoors, definitely be prepared. Sign up for some of Dr. Bontheus's courses because they're, I've, I've, the only one I've taken so far is Wilderness First Aid, and it's a great course, um, especially for the layperson to get the, the basic understanding of how things are different out there compared to being here in so in town or in closer to facilities that can take care of more imminent threats. Anyway, this video will be posted on YouTube. I don't think it's streamed to YouTube, unfortunately but it will be posted on YouTube sometime, hopefully today, and also will be on Buzzsprout on my audio podcast page and on my Facebook as a, in video form and in audio form on my uh, The Natural Medic Adventures page there. So if you've enjoyed this, make sure to give me a thumbs up on if you're on YouTube. If you're listening on podcasts, it allows for reviews. I'd love to get a review and all that good stuff. But thanks so much for listening, watching, and we will see you out there on the trail, guys. Take care.